This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who have hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman Pope rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise Beware the ancient Papal lie With such a cloud Of witnesses Who by grace Died in their Lord Recall their Memory to say By the same Faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new episode on Hour of the Truth, today Wednesday the 13th of January. I've been uh, very busy the last days uh, reading and preparing uh, Rulers of Evil and uh, also the German um, reading that I do from Babylon nach Rom, meaning the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Therefore I haven't had much time to prepare something for Hour of the Truth. But I stumbled about an article on the Catholic News Agency the last days, and that is from the 7th of January 2016. And um, the article is called, uh, in first prayer video, Pope stress interfaith unity. We are all children of God. Yeah, we are all children of God. That's right. But I am not a child of the God of the Pope. Let's be sure about that. Because the Pope has a God that connects all different religions in this world. And every religion, you have to understand, is man-made. There is only one true belief. And that is the belief in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob of the Bible, the 1611 King James Bible, which we will later approach in another reading an understandable history of the Bible after I went through this little article here. So from Vatican City on the 7th of January it says the Pope's first ever video message on this month's prayer intentions was released Tuesday highlighting the importance of interreligious dialogue and the beliefs different faith traditions hold in common such as the figure of God and love. You know this is what the Pope always does. We have to concentrate on what we have in common and not on what is dividing us, because division is no good. But as a Bible-believing Christian, you have division from the standpoint of the Pope, because you do not compromise. 
the truth does not compromise, God, the God of the Bible, does not compromise, and Satan also does not compromise. So when you have two parties that do not compromise, you don't go in between their making compromises, do you? Because when you make a compromise, you will always lean to one master. And when you lean to the one master of the one world coming, one world religion, then you will be leaning to Satan and not to the God of the Bible. So, he speaks about the figure of God and the figure of love. He has no problem speaking about God, of course, because Satan is his God. He doesn't tell you that, but that's what it is. And what does he call love? Look at what the Roman Catholic Church in their history has done in wars, genocides, killings, and still does all over the world, all under the name of love. You know, you should take every word the Pope says, turn it 180 degrees around, and then you got the truth. And the article continues on the second paragraph here with a quote from Pope Francis. Uh, in this message released January 6th, the Feast of Epiphany. Quote, many think differently, feel differently, seeking God or meeting God in different ways. In this crowd, in this range of religions, there's only one certainty that we have for all. We are all children of God. Unquote. At the beginning of the video, which is included in the article, and the link to the article is included in the video that you are watching right now. A minute and a half long, the Pope cites the fact that the majority of Earth's inhabitants profess some sort of religious belief. This, he said, should lead to a dialogue among religions. We should not stop praying for it and collaborating with those who think differently. The video goes on to feature representatives from Buddhism, Christianity, Islam and Judaism who proclaim their respective beliefs in God, Jesus, Christ, Allah and Buddha. You know, these guys say there and say, I believe in Buddha, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Allah, I believe in Christ. And then later on they say, I believe in love, I believe in love. Well, yeah, it's easy to say that, practice it. Later on, after the Pope affirms that all, regardless of their religious profession, are children of God, the faith leaders stake their common belief in, state their common belief in love, as I just said. Pope Francis closes the video by expressing his hope that viewers, quote, will spread my prayer request this month, that sincere dialogue among men and women of different faiths may produce fruits of peace and justice. I have confidence in our prayers. End of quote. An initiative of the Jesuit-run Global Prayer Network, Apostleship of Prayer, the video was filmed in collaboration with Vatican Television Center, CTV, and marks the first time the Pope monthly prayer intentions have been featured on video. The Apostleship on Prayer was founded by Jesuit seminarians in France in 1884 <coughs> to encourage Christians to serve God and others through prayer, particularly for the needs of the church. Let me just stop right here. The needs of the church. Don't you see anything wrong with that? It's all about Jesus, it's all about God, not about the church, but of course the Roman Catholic Church teaches something different. And very interesting, I hope that you understood this, this semin these are Jesuit seminarians from France. Jesuits. They are the Regimini Militante Ecclesiae. They are the church at war. Understand that everything that comes from the Jesuits has nothing to do with the God of the Bible. Since the late 1800s, the organization has also received a monthly intention from the Pope. In 1929, an additional missionary intention was added by the Holy Father, aimed at the faithful in particular. 1929, interesting year, huh? Referred to on the organization's website as the Pope's universal and evangelization intentions, this month's prayer requests focus on Francis' desire for interreligious dialogue 
and Christian unity. Well, you can only have unity when you have also the same basis of authority and the Pope and I and probably you do not have the same authority because I stand on the authority of the 1611 King James Bible, the book the Pope hates and loves to forbid and loves to persecute and loves to falsify and to corrupt all over the world with all his different um, versions that come out there. Francis offers his universal petition, the article continues, so that sincere dialogue among men and women of different faiths may produce the fruits of peace and justice, and expresses his evangelistic prayer that, quote, by means of dialogue and fraternal charity, and with the grace of the Holy Spirit, Christians may overcome divisions, unquote. Christians may overcome divisions. Well, this is a key sentence, and also the last one that I'm probably going to read from this article. How can you overcome divisions? There are two ways how you can overcome divisions. The one way is that you are convincing somebody else of your standpoint and that he takes your standpoint. And another one is that you just compromise your own standpoint. So, when you compromise your standpoint, you are leaving the authority that you stand on. You are leaving the rock and going on sand. You shouldn't do that. When you want to convince somebody of your conviction, and your conviction is a true conviction because of the 1611 Bible, because of God ruling your conscience, then the other one doesn't have to make compromise, he just has to give up. That's why God says in Revelation 18 verse 4, Come out of her, my people. With that, he doesn't mean that you compromise your belief that you have in the church of Satan. With that, he means that you have to go out of the church of Satan and come to him completely. Well, the Pope wants the same thing. He also wants everybody just to make compromises and changes just to come to him. The problem is, he has the bad church. And what is the good church? The good church is Jesus Christ. And that is not even a visible, that is not even a physical church that we have here. The church, Ecclesia, communication, uh, communion, as you can, uh, as you can have, find it in the Bible, as Jesus explains it, is when Wherever two or three of you are together in their midst, I will be. That is church. That is real communion. That is real fellowship that you can have. You don't need to go into a big building with a steeple roof. You don't need to go in a big building with crosses and idols hanging all over there. Absolutely not necessary. You can meet anywhere and study the Bible and have fellowship in the love, in the name of Jesus Christ. That is important. That's the only important thing that there is. And you can go out there and try to convince a Muslim. You can go out there and try to convince a Buddhist. You can go out there and try to convince a Hindu or even a Catholic of the real belief. But what we do not do is use violence. And this is a distinction from, for example, Islam. Islam uses violence for its uh, spreading around in the world. And so does Catholicism. Only Catholicism hides it, because they are a political power hidden under spirituality. And you don't see the shadow government they are building up. So this whole article here from the Pope just tells me once again it is another step in trying to get people to accept a one world religion where everybody is happy and where there are many ways to God. And Jesus said there is only one way to the Father and that is Him. I am the way, the truth and the life and nobody comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. And the Pope teaches something else. First and for all he teaches like I stated some episodes ago, that having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is dangerous. And second of all, 
you have to have a mediator between you and Jesus Christ, Mary, which is absolutely unscriptural. And you have Mary in the Roman Catholic Church, and you have Madonna and all these uh, idols they use in Islam, and you have the same mediators in Hinduism and Buddhism. So everywhere you have a mediator that is not in the Bible. So that is not the real true belief. But because all these other religions have the same goal and have the same foundation, because all these religions are actually made up by Satan in the first place, because they have the same common ground, it is not so difficult for them to come together to one religion, something that is different from real Bible-believing Christians. They have to make here and there a little compromise and still see the same goal that they have been taught all their lives of their religion. That is not something that the Bible teaches, that is not something that the Bible follows, and that is not something that you follow when you follow the Bible. You know? So, this one world religion is surely gonna come, and it is for most part of the world very easy to do, because they have to make very little small compromises to come together and be as one. The one. O-N-E in capital letters. The one. And that is not the God of the Bible. Okay, now, enough about this article. I'm checking these uh, websites daily and every time again I <laughs> I'm not feeling very well when I g see what, what he always puts out there to betray the people and the people just don't get his message that uh, is hidden behind Jesuitical casuistry and sophistry, you know. It's like you look at your one dollar bill and it says in God we trust. But it doesn't say which God, right? If you want to know which God your government trusts in that brings out these bills. Uh, okay, it's not your government, it's the Federal Reserve, but you know what I mean. Then follow my reading of Rulers of Evil. And you will understand that. I can't speak of that right here because it would go too far. But uh, I can tell you, you will really uh, get your eyes opened when you read this book, Rulers of Evil. Or you read along with me when I read it online on my channel. But um, it's a little time ago since we have been reading in the book An Understandable History of the Bible. And... Um, the latest weeks, since I'm doing more and more research and readings in German, I have to rely on the Luther Bible, 1545, 1984, 1912, whatever. And I see more and more confirmation of everything that I read in this book, An Understandable History of the Bible, which promotes the King James, why the King James Version is the only version in our time today that is true. I can tell you, the German Bible often doesn't make any sense to me. Because it's using words and phrases and, and, and I don't know, I, I, I don't even get the sense out of it. When I read Daniel chapter 9, I don't even get the sense of what it's, what it's speaking about. I get the sense in English. And every time again I see the 1611 King James Bible really is the right version. So last time we ended on um, this last part that I was reading there from God's method. I'm just going to repeat the last two paragraphs because that leads us into the localities which I'm going to continue today reading for you. But why the authorized version, the author asks. Who says we have to use this uh, only this particular translation? Why couldn't some other versions be perfect in English instead of the authorized version? To get the answers to these questions, we'll have to take off our hands of each other's throats long enough to examine the evidence which has come down to us in history. But first, let's study where the manuscripts came from. So there we go to the localities, starting with family feud. The manuscripts and their classifications and readings will be studied in later pages. What we shall do now is closely scrutinize the primary centers from which our extant manuscripts have originated. It will be revealed in later study that biblical manuscripts, 
MSS, are divided into two general groups. These two groups have been found to disagree with each other in many areas. Every English Bible in existence today will be found to proceed more or less from one of these two groups. The fact that there is one God plainly tells us that there can be only one correct reading concerning any given discrepancy between those two groups. Obviously, prior to comparing readings, it will be beneficial to investigate the ancient centers from which our two basic groups proceed. Earlier, we established the two ground rules. It will be relevant to our study to review those rules at this point and to keep them in mind as we continue. Firstly, we established that the Bible is a spiritual book, which God exerted supernatural force to conceive, and it is reasonable to assume that he could exert that same supernatural force to preserve it. Secondly, that Satan desires to be worshipped. He has the ability to counterfeit God's actions and definitely will be involved actively in attempting to destroy God's words and or our confidence in that word, while seeking to replace it with his own versions. The fact that the disagreement between these two families is centered around points of deity or doctrine tells us that one of them must be the preserved text as found in the original MSS manuscripts, while the other is a satanic forgery. Satan attacked Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11, as you probably remember, and will try to replace him in the future, as we can read in Revelation 13 verses th uh, 1 through 8. Are we to believe that Satan, a sworn enemy of truth, is not going to attempt to disrupt the travel of God's word through history? Would he dare let the only tangible item with which God has left us remain untacked? No. Satan cannot afford to allow the Holy Scriptures to be unmolested. He would obviously be heard to be its loudest textual critic and will attempt to eliminate God's true word while replacing it with his own satanic counterfeit. With this in mind, we shall begin the original autographs and trace the history of the two families of MSS. The Beginning Jesus Christ always worked through his followers. It is only logical that he would look to his followers as instrumental in the preservation of his words. In the New Testament, the New Testament was a paradox. It was completely foreign to anything that the world had ever known. Until the time of Christ, the world was biblically divided into two groups. One was the Jews. They were known as God's chosen people. Now let me intervene right here. One was the Jews. They were known as God's chosen people. I only partially agree. Because we had Israel, 12 tribes chosen as God's people. The Jews were the last in the land of Judea to stay there because the otherwise were the others were already pursed over the world. All right, I give you that, but it was Israel in the first place. God said to Jacob, "Your name is Israel." Right? So, not your name is Jew. The Jews are only one of the twelve tribes. Please keep that in mind when I'm reading on. You know, I do not agree 100% with everything that the author writes. One was the Jews. They were known as God's chosen people. Their religious practices were found on the teachings of the law, the prophets and the writings, 39 books which comprise our present Old Testament. They awaited their Messiah, the ruler who was expected at any time to come to earth and set up a Jewish kingdom based in Jerusalem. The other group spoken of in scripture is the Gentile population of the world. The Gentiles are also referred to as a group by the terms Greek. They were very religious, but heathenistic in practice. This is noted by the Apostle Paul. When in Athens he mentions that the city was wholly given to idolatry, as we read in Acts 17 verse 16. After seeing them carry out their religious duties, he concluded, Quote, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Unquote. Acts 17.22 
the Gentile world was caught up in the fantasies of Christless education, philosophy and religion. Exactly the same as we have today, while we go through learning against learning, invented by the Jesuits coming from Medici learning. Christless education, Christless philosophy and Christless religion is everything that is taught today in the world. So, what has changed the last 2000 years in the big part of the so-called society? Not so much, eh? The author continues, another location of pagan religious practice was Rome. In Rome were found temples built for the worship of many pagan gods and goddesses. A few of these are Jupiter, Apollo and Minerva. Well, I did lately a reading on uh, mystery uh, Babylon mystery religion uh, I think it was chapter 5 you have to check that out and there I spoke about the major gods and the minor gods of Rome that you can find with interesting links in there uh, to a website where you can uh, look up all these different gods that he just mentioned here the three Jupiter Apollo and Minerva and study that book a little bit further it's really interesting I can advise you to have a look at that Babylon mystery religion reading that I'm doing now the author continues, still another pagan city known for its education and philosophy was Alexandria, Egypt, famed for its library and school. It was a center of education during the centuries prior to the New Testament era. It was known to have received much of its philosophy from Athens, about 100 BC, before Christ. It's also something I go into this Babylon mystery religion in. And uh, a lot of these... Um, uh, of, of these writings that were in uh, Alexandria, in the uh, in the library of Alexandria, were taken by Mark Anthony and uh, brought to uh, Verona in Italy. And um, it's first and for all the Medici family that has all these uh, papers from that time. I tell you, it's very interesting to follow that reading of Babylon mystery religion too. And a lot of things that I read here come even back from there. So it all intertwines, you see. Now, when the Christian church appeared, made up of born-again believers, it was looked upon as a rather strange group of people. The Jews rejected it because its patrons claimed that Jesus Christ was the Jewish Messiah. Well, something the Jews said he wasn't. The Gentiles rejected rejected Christianity because of the Christians claim that salvation was complete and that one could know that they had eternal life. This ran contrary to the teachings of pagan philosophy that nothing can be sure uh, can be known for sure. It also made their heathen religious practices worthless, not to mention all of their beautiful temples. The New Testament church needed a place to grow. It needed a location that was far away from the prejudices of the Jewish religious community centered in Jerusalem and the Gentile philosophical community. It needed a location that would be advantageous to the advantages to the spreading of the gospel. Such a location was realized when, after the death of Stephen, you know, the stoning of Stephen ending the seventy years prophecy of Daniel, the believers traveled to Phoenix, Cyprus and Antioch, as we can read in Acts chapter eleven, verse nineteen. But it was Antioch that the Holy Spirit chose for the base of Christian operations. Antioch was founded in, by Silius uh, I, about 300 before Christ. Its location was of prime importance to the Gospel, since it was built on the crossroads of ancient, ancient trade routes from Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean and from the Western Arabia to Asia Minor. It also has a seaport on the Orontes River. In addition to the secular history of these two areas, let us examine what the Bible says concerning them. The law of first mention is uh, important, as the first mention of a subject usually sets the light in which what subject shall reside in the Bible narrative. We go to Egypt. Since one of the two families of MSS originated in Alexandria, Egypt, we shall first look at Egypt. Egypt is first mentioned in Genesis 12, verse 10. Quote, Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there. Unquote. 
But verse 12 says, quote, Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Unquote. Genesis 12, verse 12. Immediately we find a negative air about Egypt in the Bible. Notice that Abram's fear concerns the line of Christ, Satan's first enemy. Quote, and the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard, unquote, as we read in Genesis 37, verse 36. Here we find Joseph sold into slavery in Egypt. This is also negative. Quote, Therefore they did set them over the taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasures, treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Unquote. Exodus chapter 1 verse 11. In this verse we see Israel, the people of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. You see, not the Jews, Israel, persecuted in Egypt, a type of the world. Verses 15 and 16 show that Satan's attack was once again on the seed through which the Lord Jesus Christ would come. In Exodus 20 verse 2, Egypt is called, quote, the house of bondage. In Deuteronomy 4 verse 20, God calls Egypt, quote unquote, the iron furnace. God forbids Israel to carry on commercial activities with Egypt in Deuteronomy 17 verse 16, quote, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way." Unquote. Notice his final sentence gives them solemn warning, quote, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. In Jeremiah 46 verse 25 we find God prom promising punishment on Egypt. Quote, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saith, Behold, I will punish the multitude of No and Pharaoh and Egypt with their gods and their kings, even Pharaoh and all them that trust in him. Unquote. Now look at Ezekiel 20, verse 7. Quote, then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Unquote. Here we find that God commanded Israel not to be associated with Egypt's idolatry. The last of our references compares Jerusalem in apostasy to Sodom and Egypt. Quote, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Unquote. As we can read in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. This is only a small cross-section of the Bible references to Egypt, but I believe we see that God's attitude towards Egypt is not positive. Now let's zero in on the city of Egypt which will concern our study, Alexandria. Alexandria is first mentioned in Acts 6 verse 9, quote, then, there are, then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them in Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen." Unquote. Here we find that Jews from Alexandria were partially, were partially responsible for the stoning of Stephen. Also in Acts 18 verse 24, we find Apollos was from Alexandria. Although he was later saved and became a great disciple of Christ, he was first associated with inadvertently uh, misleading the people of Ephesus in Acts 19, verses 1 through 3. We have now looked at what the Bible has to say concerning Egypt in general, and Alexandria in particular. Since we accept the Bible in all matters of faith and practice, we should take care to remember that God takes a negative approach to Egypt. Do we have any right to ignore God's displeasure and approach Egypt in a positive manner? Solomon was by far wiser than we are, yet he ignored God's clear warnings. For example, 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 1 says, quote, 
and solomon made affinity with the pharaoh king of egypt and took pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of david until he had made an end of buildings in his own house and the house of the lord and the wall of jerusalem round about Unquote. also in first kings 10 verse 28 says it says quote, and solomon had horses brought out of egypt and linen yarn the king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price Unquote. We find that ignoring God's word led to the heart I'm sorry <laughs> we find that ignoring God's word led to the heart being turned away from the Lord and after other gods. That's what God always warned about, as we can read also in first Kings eleven verse three and four. This resulted in abominable acts on his part in first Kings eleven verse five and eight, and finally brought God's judgment in first Kings eleven nine through forty three. Certainly, if wise Solomon could fall by accepting Egypt in spite of God's clear condemnation, we would do well to take care before we buy any horses out of Egypt. God may not be pleased with such actions. I think if he wasn't pleased with that 3,000 years ago, he is not pleased about that today. Now let's see what we have to say about Antioch. Antioch is first mentioned in Acts chapter 6 verse 5 when Nicholas a Christian from Antioch was chosen to be one of the first deacons so we see that the first time Antioch is mentioned is in a positive light Antioch is mentioned again in Acts chapter 11 verse 19 here it is a refuge for Christians from persecution in the scripture Antioch represents a quote-unquote type of the new life given to believers after having accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior to fully understand the light in which the Bible presents Antioch in Acts 11, we must look at the context in which chapter 11 is written. In the preceding chapters, Acts 10, God, explain, uh, God plainly shows that he is calling out a following from among the Gentiles. In the following chapters, Acts 11, uh, 12, sorry, God shows that he is not going to use Jerusalem as the center of the New Testament church, as we can read in Acts 11 chapter 12 verses 1 through 4 no of course not Jerusalem is to be destroyed our Antioch Antioch is the new center is away from the Gentile centers of Alexandria Athens and Rome and the Jewish center of Jerusalem Antioch symbolizes the Christians new life apart from the heathenism of the Gentiles and ritualism and of Judaism in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17 says, quote, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Unquote. When a Gentile is saved, he is to leave his heathenic life lifestyle for a new spiritual location in Christ. Likewise, when a Jew is saved, he is to leave his ritualism for a new spiritual location in Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul states that, quote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Unquote. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, he divides mankind into three groups, Jews, Gentiles, the Church of God. Well, <laughs> three groups? No, ah, 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 that's, that depends on how you see it. Jews is one group, Gentiles is the other, and the Church of God is where they are both together when they are saved by Jesus Christ. So, okay, it's three groups. As God gives born-again man a new spiritual location, he also gave his new young church a new physical location please notice that after Acts chapter 12 the other apostles are left alone at Jerusalem and are mentioned only one last time in the narrative this is in Acts chapter 21 verse 18 where they briefly rejoice in Paul's report and then get preoccupied with the law Paul in Galatians 2 verse 11 had to rebuke Peter of this very thing when he came to Antioch and try to exercise the same legalistic teaching of Judaism of the, uh, on the New Testament church there. 
Obviously, God was using Antioch and Antiochian Christians to forge a new practice of worshipping him, different from the Old Testament Judaism and the Gentile mythology and heathenism. Now we see where God's move comes in. In Acts chapter 11 verse 20 it shows the beginning of God's settlement in Antioch. Quote, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were, uh, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Unquote. In Acts 11 verse 22, Barnabas, one of the most important figures of the New Testament, moves from Jerusalem to Antioch. He is the man who is responsible for Paul being in the ministry. It was Barnabas who went to Tarsus to get Paul, then named Saul, in Acts 11.25. Upon finding him, Barnabas brought him back to Antioch, not Jerusalem, as we can read in Acts 11, verse 26. So we see that the primary figure of the New Testament church actually began his ministry in Antioch. Paul had visited Jerusalem in Acts 9, 26 through 29, and had even preached there, but his ministry to the Gentiles really began when he departed from Antioch in Acts 13 verses 1 through 3 with Barnabas. We must also notice that it was at Antioch that the disciples were called Christians for the first time, as we can read in Acts 11 verse 26. In verse 27 we find that the prophets from Jerusalem's church left to settle in Antioch. In verse 29 we see that it was necessary for the Christians in Antioch to send relief down to their brethren in Jerusalem. As we mentioned before, Paul's first missionary journey originated from Antioch in Acts 13 verses 1 through 3. The Bible states in verse 2 that the Holy Ghost quote-unquote called him. It was in Antioch that God chose these men. Upon returning from their trip in Acts 14 26 to 28, they came back to Antioch, not Alexandria, not Jerusalem. They came back to Antioch. When some Christian Judaizers came up to Antioch from Jerusalem and began to teach the believers there that, quote, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved, unquote, as we can read in Acts 15, verse 1, Paul and Barnabas confronted them. Afterwards, Paul and Barnabas went down and spoke with the apostles concerning this. They formed a council and returned to their beloved Antioch with a written statement to the effect that Judaism had no hold over the New Testament church. Yeah. How can Judaism have a hold over the New Testament church when Judaism rejects Jesus Christ? But, of course, Judaism, you have to understand, the term Judaism that is also used here in this book, you always have to, to bear in mind that Judaism means the corrupted, Talmudic, Babylonian-influenced Judaic belief system. It has nothing to do with the pure belief system, the Jews, like all the other Israelite tribes had before. And that is still the same today. The Jews today follow the Talmud. That is Babylonian. That is mixing the holy with the profane. And that's why the apostles at that time formed the council and returned to their beloved Antioch with a written statement to the effect that Judaism had no hold over the New Testament church. Because Judaism rejects Jesus Christ. The author continues, Upon returning to Antioch, Paul and Barnabas took with them chosen men of the Jerusalem church, Silas being one of them, as we can read in Acts 15, verse 22. They all returned to Jerusalem, but Silas, as we can read in Acts 15, 33 and 34, and he is the only one whom we find recorded in the New Testament history. After Acts chapter 11 and the move to Antioch, God used only those who left Jerusalem and settled in Antioch. Isn't that wonderful? God used only those who left Jerusalem and settled in Antioch. 
There is nothing holy more in Jerusalem. That's why you can leave there. There was nothing holy 2000 years ago. There's nothing holy right now anymore. Those times are over. Now the author continues, such is the case with Paul, Barnabas, Silas and Mark. Paul and Barnabas reside at Antioch in Acts 15.35 and depart from there again in verse 40. Notice that Paul sets his mind to go back to Jerusalem in Acts 20 verse 22, knowing that it is against God's will, as we will find in Acts 20.23 20, and 21 verse, 20, uh, verse 4, and again in 21 verses 10 through 12. But he goes to Jerusalem in spite of God's warning against it and is seized in Acts 21 verse 30, thus beginning the end of his ministry. This plainly teaches that the Christian is not to return to his old life in any way, shape or form, and should stand firm in his new location in Christ. It also shows that if there will be any center for the New Testament Christianity, it will be found in Antioch, and surely not in Jerusalem or Alexandria. Isn't there a verse in the Bible about a dog that returns to his vomit? I think that is a parable that I just read here about that. It may well be that many of the originals that we have heard so much about were written right there in Antioch. Egypt is a type of this world. Antioch is a type of Christians' new life in Christ. Which one do you think that God would use to preserve his word? God will not do anything contrary to his nature. It would not be consistent with God's nature to use Alexandria, Egypt, to preserve his word when he paints such a dismal picture of it in scripture. In fact, there is no record of any of the New Testament Christians ever visiting there. Antioch, on the other hand, was greatly used by God as the center of New Testament Christianity. Paul never took up residence in Jerusalem but always returned to Antioch. Looking from the spiritual and practical aspect, Antioch would obviously be the logical, the logical location of the true Bible text. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. It's been uh, almost uh, three quarters of an hour, long enough for an hour of the truth that I'm doing solo. I'm going to do a longer one next time when I have Tom Fress on or maybe some other guest that uh, can always pop up we will see i thank you very much for listening um, go to the links that i provide in the description box here uh, listen to the book when i read it read it for yourself pick it out whether on the website or on the pdf link that i will provide that you can uh, pick up this book and study it and you will see that there is only one real preserved word of God in the world today, and that is the King James 11 Bible from 1611. I can't help it, and I can tell you one thing. A year or two, three ago, when I started to being a Christian, I had no idea how important the true word of God really was. And I'm so thankful for the Lord to show me the way that it is the King James Bible. And I'm so thankful for the Lord to impute me with this ability to read English and understand English the way that I do. It's a shame that so many people do not have that possibility and they will not ever have the possibility if they don't learn English to come to this understanding. So it is to people like me and you to try to teach them but therefore we have to be multilingual and that's not so easy, you know, speaking different languages. Uh, to me it was never uh, it was never a given. It was always hard work. Now, all of a sudden, English seems to be quite easy and I'm very thankful for that because that gives me this understanding and I hope that everybody else can also have this understanding and try to learn it. But I think that wherever you are, whatever your language, native language is, that when you pray to God for help, for the Holy Spirit, to read His Word, in the only preserved version, the 1611 King James Version, the Holy Spirit will lead you, not only to the King James Version to read it, but only also help you to read it and to understand it. Because God loves you and wants you to be saved. 
And to be saved you have to know his word, his uncorrupted word. And when you are not that able in English, he will find ways to show you. And you will learn that. I am very sure of that. Okay, thank you very much for listening and watching the video. And if you have any suggestions whatsoever, make them in the comment box. And um, hope to see you next time again. Until then, God bless you and bye-bye.